appreciate all of you taking time out of your busy, uh, your busy, hectic, unbelievably difficult schedule of playing games <laughs> to uh, come and listen to the ravings of me for about a half hour. So thank you for doing that. Did anybody get to play either Hobbit or Dialed In today? Woo, so far. Okay, cool. That's good. Almost all of you. And, you know, I really want to thank the organizers of the show for inviting me. I haven't been here since the first show, which I think uh, was five years ago. Okay. Do I need to use a microphone? All right, I'll just use the microphone. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Um, yeah, so I think I was in a paint closet at that show, right, with Curly? It was a, it was a kitchen. It was a kitchen, okay. But you guys have come a long way, but that's my point, you know, it's like this show is, is, is great, it gets bigger every year, and thank you, personally thank you, whoever organized the date that is the weekend before IAPA, because it's been the weekend after IAPA, and after I spend the whole week at IAPA, unfortunately, I just want to go home. I, I don't want to be at another show. I want to go home, I want to go to Thanksgiving, and then I want to do what I want to do. But, so thank you for uh, changing the dates around. So let's see if I can get this oriented the right way. So what we're trying to do, you know, these were hats I made uh, last October at Expo. And I'm happy to say that uh, we'll be able to sell this hat for at least another four years. Uh, possibly eight, if everything goes well. Okay, I didn't tell anybody my political affiliations, we all have whatever, but guess what? We're all one people and we all gotta get along. So it's like, it's kind of like choosing Stern or Jersey Jack or Spooky or whatever you wanna choose. It's all good, it's all pinball. So we're really all Americans and we really all need to get along. You know, work together, whoever you voted for, if you didn't vote, shame on you, but if you did vote and your candidate didn't win, maybe next time. So uh, we just gotta move on. But I'm interested in making pinball great again. Right, Steve, is that what we're doing? Can we move on to something like this? Sure. Can we move on to something other than politics? Sure. <laughs> yeah. I know Steve is sad, but uh, you know, like I said, we'll all, we'll all get along. So at our building, this is a shot and I guess I'm out of, let me move over a little bit. I put this together while I was on my uh, plane trip this morning. When I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning to uh, get a 6 a.m. flight. And then I realized when I got up that I had a 7 a.m. flight. So I went back to sleep for an hour and then they closed the road on the way to Newark Airport. And I almost missed the flight because it was 25 minutes of road construction. So it will serve me right. This is a factory tour. Uh, this is a group of, of uh, school-age um, young people who love pinball. And in fact, in their class, they, they had a whole project where they designed pinball machines, which is really cool. And uh, this was during the summertime. And there were about 60 kids that showed up. And all the boys got together all around the Hobbit game, which is not a big surprise. And for some reason, all the girls uh, for the most part, got together around Wizard of Oz. And, you know, it's, they, they played, you know, they both mixed up, but it was just kind of cool letting them loose and see who liked what. And the whole group, you know, this is the future of our industry, really, pinball, right? Young people. And that's really why I chose Wizard of Oz as the first theme. I've talked about it before, because we wanted to have a game that wasn't only male testosterone kind of game. Uh, it was something that would appeal to young people, older people, boys, girls, men, women, everybody. It would appeal to everybody. And um, this is shot in my office where uh, we were giving away, um, you know, sometimes we make mistakes on things and, you know, a normal company might throw them away. Instead, in our company, somehow I sign them with a magic marker and it becomes a collectible. Go figure. So, uh, and you can find some of those out front on the, uh, on the silent auction, too. There's a couple of those collectibles also out front. So if you want to donate some money to the Pin Project Pinball Charity, that would be a good thing. So we had all the kids there and they were having a great time. Um, I took this shot, I guess, yesterday. Um, just as I walk through the factory and I just see everything that's going on, 
Um, for somebody that had just a little tiny idea of starting a pinball company, because it was never really my dream to start a pinball company, you know, for a little while in there, it, it was difficult, then it gets more difficult, then it gets more difficult, less difficult, more difficult. That's life, you know, you go through it. So it's really kind of cool to go through the building and see really um, all these games coming together, getting built. And um, it's really very cool for us to welcome everybody to share and see what we're doing. And um, they all become fans. They all become pinball fans. They really love it. Where's Dave? Is Dave here today? Where is he? He should be listening to me in my talk. This guy pesters the heck out of me. Well, when you see him, tell him there was a slide of him and I. All right, that was a surprise for him. Yeah, you want to take a picture? I don't know how to do that. Let's see. There it is. There you go. And, you know, with the new iOS software, I got kind of messed up with this uh, keynote. I can't believe he's not here. He, it's okay. It's better that he's not here. A little up, though. It's good. He, he would ask me like 30 questions, and we'd be here till 6 o'clock at night. <laughs> so the good thing is he's not here. How many people that are here are here for the first time? Wow. I'm going to ask you guys a couple of questions after. That's really good. That's, that's really great. So I talked about Wizard of Oz. Um, right now in our building, we have two assembly lines running. We have um, the main line is running about 15 Hobbit games a day. And the small line is running about four or five uh, Wizard of Oz a day. And every single day, it seems, we sell more Wizard of Oz games, which is great. A lot of people calling, looking for games. Can I get a game for Thanksgiving? Can I get a game for Christmas? And Hanukkah fall on the same day this year and everything like that. Every day is Christmas when you get one of our games, certainly. So um, it, it's very cool. Um, here's a bunch of Wizard of Oz games in process. And that's always a great sight. Wizard of Oz this month um, on the replay on the Replay Magazine, our industry magazine, we have two or three different magazines, but I write for Replay Magazine. And uh, my column is called Jersey Jack, and the editor of the magazine gave me that name. You know, I'm from Brooklyn, uh, if you can tell by my accent. Uh, it's not the Jersey, complete Jersey accent. It's muddled with my New York, Brooklyn, New York accent. And um, so he called me Jersey Jack, and I said, I don't want to be Jersey Jack because I'm not from Jersey. And he said, well, you're Jersey Jack now, so we, we, we could call you something worse. This is about 12, 13 years ago when I started writing for Replay. Uh, he says, we could call you something worse, so hopefully you like that name. So it stuck, and then when it came time to think of a name for this pinball company, a whole bunch of people suggested Jersey Jack. And the rest, as they say, is history. Um, on this chart, this is a chart. Uh, there are ballots sent out to operators. Are there any? Is there anybody here that operates games commercially? Yes. So, do you get a replay ballot? Uh, no. You're not that big. They sell them to guys that have uh, all kinds of stuff. If you if you want to be on the ballot, just write any album an email at a replay and tell them to send you ballot. So they have all kinds of equipment, and the operators get to vote on what games are making them money. You know, in the old days, they might put down, this game is doing $100 a week. But I guess they really don't want to talk about money. So the chart is based on the rating of 1 to 10. So, and how many people in the poll had the game. So Wizard of Oz has made this poll a lot of times. Right now, this month, it's up there as number one. And 9.4 rating. And 31% of the people responding actually have the game. So that's pretty strong. And, and now that we actually have Wizard of Oz games that are available, there are more operators buying the game. You know, we solved the light issue, we solved a whole bunch of other issues, so more operators are stepping up and buying the game. And certainly, that's part of what I'll be doing this week at the amusement park show. The Hobbit. So there's a, there's a, what, Steve, which one is out there? Is that the Black Arrow, right? Yeah, Black Arrow. Okay, so I'll get to that. Uh, Hobbit, um, going along. At, at 
IAPA, at the amusement park show this week, we will have our Black Arrow Hobbit with Pendemption Coat. So even though we released what we said was the final code for Hobbit, right? Don't believe what you hear sometimes like that, okay? And that's a mouthful. So there's a new code update that will be released. Um, it fixes some things, I think, in the release before. And it also has Pendemption. So what Pendemption is, um, it's a collapsed set of rules and it's options for time play of pinball machines. So the Wizard of Oz games that we have on location that operators have, they're doing really well because if you're not a really good player, you get to play the game three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, whatever the operator set it for. Plus, you're able to get through a lot of the achievable modes of the game without you know, playing this crazy full-blown uh, rule set, which is amazing. And also, we have a lot of people buying them. I think it's $199. You need the dongle to activate the software. And we'll do that with Hobbit as well. But what a lot of people do at home, they'll turn on, they'll go inside the game, and they'll just turn it on in software. They'll turn on the pendemption mode when they have kids over, they have company over, and then they'll just go back in the door and they'll just turn it back to be regular pinball machine. Pendemption will only play one player at a time. Because the obvious thing that happens with pendemption is it pays tickets. So we have a physical ticket dispenser that mounts underneath the game for the operators and amusement centers that use a ticket dispenser. And it also interfaces with the swipe card reader. Who's this guy? Hey, Gabe. So it interfaces with the swipe card reader. Hi, Dave. How are you? Good. I'm great. It's, it interfaces with the swipe card reader so that, um, you know, if you have a wireless swipe card, it goes on there. Yeah, I text people. Who's this guy? <laughs> I thought about him. I thought about him. That was a while ago, right? Yes. That was a while ago. So, on location, this is kind of what Wizard of Oz and Hobbit look like as Pendension games. They have a topper, a win ticket topper, and on the screen, you actually see the tickets. You, it's not like you took a, a pinball machine, you know, Punchy the Clown, or one of these other games, and you just stuck a ticket dispenser on it. You don't know what the heck it's doing, why a ticket's coming out, because of high score. This, these games show you what you're supposed to be uh, achieving as you're playing them, and then they reward you with tickets. So it's truly a redemption game. Um, but I don't want to say we're tricking young people into playing a pinball machine. But you could think about it that way, right? So we're teaching them. And actually, when you start the game, there's a mode in there as the operator. You can push the start button. The game will shoot. The ball will shoot itself so that you, and you'd be surprised you go to commercial locations and you see kids play a pinball machine. They don't know how to flip the flippers and they don't know how to shoot the ball. It's, you know, this is our world, all of us. And it's really amazing to see the general public, like, even at IAPA, even at the amusement park show, a lot of people that come to the show that they're in the roller coaster business, or they, they make chairs, or they make other things, and they'll come up to our games this coming week, and they won't know what to do to the game, to get the game started, or they don't know, you push the button again to add a second player, third player, fourth player. We have a lot of, a lot of educating on planet Earth to do about pinball, for sure. Um, I just love looking at those games on the line. I guess I just took another picture of them. It's just really a fun thing. And there's a lot of games in boxes um, going out. There are containers leaving for Australia and Europe and all over the world. Everybody's getting excited because we got to get a lot of things out in the last couple of weeks so that it floats where it's got to go so a lot of games get to everybody so they get stuck under the Christmas tree. Um, Black Arrow Hobbit. So I, I kind of did something that um, some people were asking for. They were actually people asking for another alternative artwork package for the Hobbit. So OK, let's go back to the well. So what we did, um, the people that bought Smaug, pretty much Smaug is all over the game. Well, you'd expect that, because it's Smaug and a special edition. It's gold. With this game, you have different artwork on both sides of the game but you still have the smell artwork work on the uh, on their back box and it's all in black. We haven't done a black game. 
So you can see the finish is a, a wet ink, uh, black ink kind of color. And, um, you know, it's got some unique things about the play field, um, easy things. Again, all games, the play field is the same, the rules are the same, and these are available. You know, we're building these now. We have maybe another 200 or so hobbits to fill orders for, so probably in the next few weeks those are gone. Um, so uh, that's the artwork on one side, that's the artwork on the other side. Play field detail, you know, for you guys, you can go out and see it. I don't have to get into all that. Um, there's going to be 750 of these. We sold about, I think about 220 so far. And I'm really, I know this sounds really bad, but I'm not really pushing the sale of the game because I want to get the rest of the pre-orders done. So these are going in like for every dozen pre-orders or 15, maybe there's one of these going in there because we want to try to be fair to everybody. Um, okay. Hey, so I threw in a couple of pictures, uh, which I'm sure will get a couple of laughs. Uh, maybe not. This is me uh, on social media when I was 14 years old. <laughs> so um, that's a CB radio, Steve, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a CB. Uh, if anybody knows what my handle was, you could win a prize. I'm not, probably not going to say it, but, um, you know. Jelly Bean. I got on the air uh, Easter time, and the people across the street had a CB, and her handle, the girl, Christine, her handle was Lollipop, and she called me Jelly Bean, and I got my ass kicked a couple times because of the, <laughs> the The good thing, you know, you're in Brooklyn, and really, I was a scrawny kid, you can obviously see. I don't know, I probably weighed 110 pounds. But I was on the track team, and I was really fast. So. Uh, <laughs> If you were going to kick my ass, you had to really catch me or ambush me or something like that. But it, that didn't happen too often. I don't want to make it sound. So, um, <laughs> this is about eight months before John Travolta started in the movie. This is in March of 1977. The movie didn't come out until later that year. And uh, if I take it to something more relevant, so there's me, um, probably 110 pounds, my Huckapoo shirt and uh, leaning on a pinball machine in my mom's basement. Uh, how many of us live in our mom's basement? No, we don't want them. So, I didn't live there. Um, you know, I started in 1975 uh, repairing uh, pinball machines. And somebody actually took a picture of me, you know, not ripping an out of border sign off again, but repairing it, I guess. And um, it was a great job. I think it's still a great job. But I, I wound up at a customer's house last Saturday. I was in Pennsylvania for an open house at the Game Gallery in Malvern, Pennsylvania. Pinball Gallery. There you go. Thank you, Steve. And um, on the way there, I went to somebody's house to fix that Wizard of Oz game. And I told the guy I'd be over at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I guess he didn't believe me because I woke him up when I rang the doorbell. And he was like taking pictures of me coming in his house fixing his game. But I fixed this game, didn't have to waste anybody else's time, it was along the way, and I was happy to do that. So it's, you know, I try not to do house calls anymore. But if I have to, I will, yes. Pressed into service, I will go. Pat Lawler, everybody knows this guy, right? Everybody? No, Pat Lawler, okay, cool. What? We didn't come with you, can't go to every show. Pat, come on out. <laughs> no. Okay. Okay, we'll get to your part of the show in a minute. <laughs> I told you what was going to happen when this guy came in, right? I told you what was going to happen. Yeah. So, um, you know, Pat, I, I tell, uh, there's so many stories, uh, and they're all good ones. Um, we, we rented a building from Pat in 2011, around March 2011, when we started Jersey Jack Pinball. Dennis Nordman, was working for us at the time, and he suggested, you know, Pat's whole building is kind of empty, why don't we approach him and rent it from him, and even though it's added away for every single person that works for us in Illinois, except me, um, you know, maybe we could make it work. So that's pretty much what happened, right? So I rented the building from him uh, at a very deep discount, and um, 
the day Pat was giving me the key, I met him at uh, Gameworks in Schaumburg, Illinois. And so I go, and Pat and I, we're having lunch, and there's a couple of pinball machines up the steps, maybe a family guy and something else. And we're just making small talk, you know. I, I, I know Pat probably since about 2011, when PinballSales.com sold a lot of Monopoly games. That's really when I got to, actually, 2001, sorry. Thank you, Steve. Um, that's what I meant. So, right. So, you know, unlike, unlike the candidates that were debating, I have a fact checker standing by. So, uh, thank you, Steve. And that's provided free, by the way. So, uh, so Pat said to me, you want some advice? And, sure, I want some advice. You know, if I actually listened to anybody, I never would have started the company, right? So he said to me, you know, it's going to be really hard to make pinball machines, and you're going to have a lot of hurdles you don't really know about right now. And I think what you should do is um, you should probably, uh, I'll go back to that screen, you should probably just make your game this much better than whatever else is out there. And I said, you know, that's going to be difficult for me to do because that would mean telling all of our people that were just aiming at mediocrity, right? And I said, Pat, you know, it was, it was easy to say this to him, but it's funny remembering it this way. I said, Pat, you know, um, we want to make the greatest game ever, or we want to believe that. And, you know, he says, well, you know, you don't really have to make Funhouse. You know, it's, it's okay. And I said, I said, Pat, um, we want to make a game that makes Funhouse look like Humpty Dumpty. And uh, Pat looked at me, and I could tell you, you know, he didn't say anything else, but you could just imagine what his thought was. Probably, this guy is insane. He, he's, you know, he lost it. Let me just not say anything to him. Let me get the rent check, and let me give him the key, and wish him the best. Okay? So circle that conversation forward a couple of years, and Pat sees what we're doing, and Pat sees how it's, you know, responding in the marketplace, and he sees the passion and the commitment of our people, and Pat wanted to be part of Jersey Jack Pinball, and I wanted Pat to be part of Jersey Jack Pinball, and really, talking to Pat about it any time before that could happen, right? There was no sense me saying to him at that point, hey, come on and work for us, because, you know, it's still a lot of dreams and things on the drawing board, and you haven't done anything yet. You didn't make a game yet. You didn't do this. You didn't sell. How many were you going to sell? And how are you going to build them? And you don't have a factory. So Pat coming into the company was really a spectacular thing. And I knew if he was going to come into the company, I was not going to give him a license and say to him, you know, I picked this license for you, and you're going to make this thing like it or not. What I, and Pat was fully expecting that. He, he talked about it a little bit at Pinball Expo. But in my mind, I wanted Pat to have the freedom, maybe the freedom that he never had in his career, almost at any place, maybe since he did Twilight Zone, where I wanted him to have the complete freedom to do whatever he wanted to do. And maybe there's some things he did that I would have done differently, or suggested differently, whatever. I'm thrilled with Dial In. I, I think it's a spectacular game. You're playing a game that's about 22% code right now in the game, and it's going to be the future of a lot of things that we do in pinball, and I'll explain some more of that to you. So this was at, um, why did this get small? Okay, good old Apple, I love Apple. This. Um, this was the room where it happened, as I said, for those Hamilton fans. And I don't know how many people were in the room. Uh, Steve, you have a fact check on that? You have a number? No. Is this, this Lots of people. Pinball Expo. This this a month year. ago. This year. No, that's absolutely right. Yeah, that was it was full. You couldn't, you know, I, I, think, I think Charles was sitting on somebody's lap. I think there was no room there. And we had Charles, Charles Thomas, longtime friend, Jersey Jack, pinball supporter, and good guy. Um, I gave him the job of periscoping this event. The only problem was I didn't teach him how to manage the periscope commentary. So there were people on periscope saying the wackiest 
screwed up things than you could imagine. But guess what? There were 1,600 people yeah. watching on Periscope, okay, for something that we threw together in, in, in moments, and basically three or 400 people in a room. So imagine you have 2,000 people, more, give or take 1,000, no, 2,000 people, right, interested in what this guy created. I mean, how cool is that? And, and it, was, it was truly a lot of fun. And um, Pat, uh, Pat had a great time. He had a really great experience, and you could see how happy he was at the reaction and how joyful he was at explaining all the cabinet changes, the, the speaker box change, the, all the electronics is in the head of the game. The game actually has a bubble level. I know we're going for technology to the 14,000th power, but you know, there's a bubble level in the game, so we didn't throw away tradition for things that really matter. So there are three models of dialed in. And I'd just like to say something about the name. Who, who doesn't like, who, don't, who doesn't? Who of you do not like that name? Good. Because the name is Stain. I'm not changing it. Right. <laughs> so here's, here's what happened with the name. And this might be breaking news, really, right? Breaking news here. You know, I heard the name Donkey Kong one time. I was at a show. And, and there was no internet at the time. And I heard the name Pac-Man at a show one time. And I played that Pac-Man game for the first time way back at the Conrad Hilton so many, many years ago when I could fit into that Huckapoo shirt. And um, I said, what a silly name. But it was a spectacular game. So there were people that said, oh, dial in. Who dials? What's dial in? You know, like, OK. And, and there was a tiny knee-jerk reaction in our company because we always want to please our customers. Let's face it. You guys are buying all the games and playing all the games. But look, this was different. I didn't take any deposits on it. Pat worked on it all that time. Three years he's working for the company. He worked on the game. You know, he had a little finger into the Hobbit also. But he worked on the game all that time. And, um, you know, that was the name of the game. So, you know, when we did Wizard of Oz and we took your money, Every time a coil fell off the shelf, we did a release. Hey, this just happened, that just happened. And we got killed a lot of times. There were, there were things that we showed that went over really well, and there were things that we showed that went over badly until everybody saw how it was going to fit in the game, right? Because you, you, you can't judge on a snapshot, even though we're in the world of instant gratification today, right? So with this game, the idea was we're going to release the game, we're going to show everybody the game at Expo, and we're going to be building these games in a few months. You're not going to be waiting three years, and we didn't take anybody's money, so we can call the game whatever we want it to be. So the funny thing about, about it, the funny thing about it is, um, what is the funny thing? Let's plug this in here. Okay. Earth to, uh, okay, that will come up sometime. Yes? No? Okay. There we go. Okay, thank you. There you go. Good. Technical difficulty. You know, when I was a, little, when I was a kid in uh, fifth grade, fourth grade, I was on the AV squad. Anybody on the AV squad? Anybody even know what that was? I used to, I, I was the only kid in the school that could figure out how to run the film strip projector. You know? And, and I would do the thing and it would go, you know, it would be like, Spinning around and everything, nobody knows what the hell that is. So, pretty, pretty bad. But I got you. So, um, dialed in it is, and dialed in it will stay. So, uh, we're very happy with that. And uh, so, the few people that didn't like the name that were vocal, um, when we cha when we, when I said at the Buffalo Pinball Podcast that I was going to finesse the name, and Steve texted me and said, "What does finesse mean?" I don't know, it's a word. You know, we're going to finesse the name. People emailed me and called me immediately and said, listen, I hated that name, but now I love that name. Don't change the name of the game. That's what it is. That's right. That's what it is. Um, there'll be a couple of slight changes, you know, as we go forward here and there, but only minor things. Um, so there are three models to the game, uh, as we typically do. Standard, uh, Ellie. So there's a standard limited edition and a collector's edition. And uh, 
So standard game, retail price is $8,000, the limit is $9,000, collectors is twelve five. What the heck makes the difference between a collector and a limited game? So aside from, and in the next few weeks, two, three weeks, I'll, I'll get to tell everybody exactly what those things are, but I want to create experience items in the game that are really cool for a collector, that are unique for that person, that discriminating person, that wants that high-end special game. It's not designed to make us so much extra money. It's kind of designed to give the collector something that's really specifically unique for them. So that's what I'm going after. So if you can think about experience items, sometimes you go to a charity auction and you're bidding on an item like, I get to throw out the first pitch in a Yankee game. Well, how often is something like that gonna happen? So those are the kind of things I wanna to put together for uh, pinball people, okay? And that's probably all I'll say about that at the moment. And I'm, we're gonna take questions after, so. Um, this was thrown in, I'm not gonna go through all of it because the game is here, but when you, go, when you go to this game, this is an amazing game that, and I just updated some code today on them also. Uh, you're in Quantum City and it's a typical, amazing, typical Pat Lawler disaster game, right? Like Whirlwind and Earth all these, right? Earthshaker, it, it's in that mode. It just happens to have a phone that's involved with the game. Because pretty much everything in my life revolves around a phone. And pinball has always been a snapshot. If you go out in the Great Hall here and you look at pinball machines, what you see are snapshots of what was going on in the world at that time. You know, when space travel just happened, or sci-fi, or, you know, Bon Voyage, and there's a girl, you know, on the back glass, you know, getting on an airplane. Wow, that's a novel idea. You know, but all the things that pinball showed and reflected back in the day, they would design a pinball machine, and a bunch of guys, no women, would sit around and say, okay, Charlie, uh, what did we make? We made, uh, last game we made was a baseball game, and then we made a card game, and what do we, uh, let's make a bowling game. And, you know, that's not how we design things today. Today, everything is so integrated, what the theme is. And the cool thing about this game is that we can, we can keep building on it and building on it and building on it. Um, this is a shot from a few weeks ago at the factory where that's Steve Bowden, champion pinball player, and the guys and, and gal from Buffalo Pinball, they did a, uh, a podcast. Did anybody see that at all? It is online. So... It explained the gameplay and what the game is really well. It was on Twitch. Yeah. It was on Twitch. Right. If you go on Twitch, Buffalo Pinball, it's really cool. I think it's it's three hours. You don't have to watch all three hours. Of it, you know? watch all their other stuff too. If you right. don't know, they're awesome. I can, you know, I know these things are all online. Myself personally, I can't stand to listen to myself, so I never watch myself. Um, you know, thank you, Steve. And, and, you know, really, uh, it's like my wife, too. You know, my daughter, Jen, works with a company. Jack works with a company. You know, if they hear me one time, that's pretty much enough. So you really don't have to hear me again. But everywhere we go with the games, big crowds. Uh, here is no different. Um, and, you know, it was nice at Expo to have five games. Because I once uh, showed up um, at Pacific Pinball Expo with one Wizard of Oz game years ago that was a box of lights. And we had about 70 people online to play one ball at a time. And yeah, yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was crazy. So I, I love this picture because this is a really great pinball collector. His first name is Steve, and he's from California. And he loves, loves, loves pinball. And this was an expo, and he was just inhaling the whole game as he was watching it and looking at it. Um, and really, that's. That's what we want the games to be. We want them to be playable artwork. Uh, all the people that work on them really need to have a, a passion. Um, anybody want one of these shirts? I mean, bring them with me today. Uh, we're out of them, but they'll be on the website if anybody wants one. We're not doing a Kickstarter or anything like that to get a t-shirt. So you can just go to the website, go buy a t-shirt, but not a problem. Um, next. Saturday, for those that are in Florida still, because I'll still be here next Saturday. I'll be in Delray. I might take a residency here. Uh, it's nice this time of the year especially. Thank you, Florida. So I'll be in Delray at the Silver Ball Museum. 
So that'll be my first trip there. They have a Wizard of Oz, they have a Hobbit, and we'll bring them some dialed in games. We'll do an event there, and that's going to be really cool. I don't know why I threw this in there. Uh, this is uh, me, and the person on my right is that guy who I'll introduce in a minute, Steve. And the person on my left is Larry, who has worked for me since 1996, and Larry's vice president of manufacturing now, and he runs the factory. Here's another picture of Steve that, uh, <laughs> this is a picture that's on the refrigerator at the, uh, the building, but you really weren't in a costume. I figured you were gonna heckle me, so I had to get yeah. you back by this point of the, uh, of the event. So, come up here a minute to with me. Uh, this is Steve Zamonski. So Steve started as a customer of pinballsales.com, probably back in what, 2000? 99, wow. And, you know, I sold him so many games. How many games? 14 games? Oh, more than that, I remember. He don't remember. 20, 20 yeah, he, he, till he maxed out all his credit cards. Yeah. And then he came to work for me. Never I got out of jail. Right. No, he didn't go to jail. And then he came to work for the company, and he's worked for pinballsales.com all those years in service, delivery, setting up games, talking people off ledges when they have issues with their games. Steve is still involved with technical support, so starting in about 10 days, I guess. So in addition to Lloyd on the phone, customer service, and Frank and Victor, you'll have Steve as well. So uh, Steve was in Final Test, he was involved in every phase of everything we ever did. A resident pinball expert, and uh, really, really great to have him here with me at the show this week. Uh,